Welcome into the Husker 24 7 podcast. I'm Mike Schaefer, joined by Michael Brunts, Brian Christofferson here on a Wednesday. Fall camp has been rolling along, and we figured we should dive into what we have learned so far. But before we get into today's activity, gentlemen, how's it going? Michael, how are you doing? I don't know when the last time I called you Michael. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, I'm good. I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. Um, I'm ready for ready for the season to begin. We're in the. You're already the out on third, fall camp. Second and third week of fall camp. It's uh, the players are starting to feel the the weight of everything, and I feel like we're 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 talking season needs to end. I think that's where I'm at. I, I'm right there with you. Uh, a guy who has been absolutely killing it during talking season is our own Brian Christopherson, who's averaging roughly 37 stories a day. Brian, I got a text from a friend of mine who wondered if you were like all the way in on Matt Rule because they can't recall this sort of output for Scott Frost or Mike Riley. I had to I had to remind him that you were only here for the 2017 year of Mike Riley, but you're you're like insane output right now is being noticed by everybody. It's like the twins winning streak has just boosted your, uh, your, your writing output here too. Maybe it's kind of like the twins winning streak. And the fact that if the twins win like five games, that's seen as like winning 20 or something when it's just five games <laughs> because they weren't really that good previously. That could be it. So there could be a parallel to that. Okay. He's got to yeah, make I, up for the twins getting swept by the Royals last weekend. Yeah. Two weekends ago. So we're, I would, I would comment on it, but my uh, A, my baseball team's new best outfielder, it was picked up from waivers from the the Oakland A's, and B, they've scored 17 runs in their last seven games. So uh, I don't think Cleveland's going to be a threat to anything other than just bad baseball. So uh, congratulations to your AL Central champions, the Minnesota Twins. Yeah, we'll see on that. Um <laughs> There's a lot of ways to still get to 79 wins for our guys. So yeah. uh, well, here, maybe the Tigers can come running along. Who knows? Yeah. I, I, honestly, it's that kind of year where you'd be like, good for you. You know, you'd kind of <laughs> pat, you'd pat Detroit on the back and kind of wish them well. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's enough banter for us. We're going to dive into, into today. So uh, longtime readers of Husker 24 seven might remember that occasionally I would put out what was called the stock market report. Uh, usually it was in later years, it's been about recruiting, but when it first started, it was just a week to week, what's up, what's down, uh, what's holding steady. So we're going to bring that to podcast form for the 2023 fall camp. And I have some names in front of me here and I'm just going to go, uh, at random, throwing a name at either Brian or Brunts and we will, uh, we'll see what they have to say if they are uh, stock up, stock down, or if it is just holding steady here in the early days of fall camp and we are uh we're gonna go with brian christopherson first and we are going to start at uh at a position that i think is going to be pretty interesting regardless of what it looks like early on let's stick with tight end and nate borkercher who i know just spoke the other day as well he is uh he's holding steady and i'm supposed to say stock up i know but this is why well, I'm going no, to say... you get to say whatever you want. There's not, you know, I did not tell you what to say here. I want the listeners to know that you're in control of your own thoughts and words. No, I he's stock up in the public's um, oh. mind. Um, he's the same guy he's been, and he's on the same uh, trajectory he's been um, for the last year or so. So I, I think he's just been steadily doing what you kind of would expect where you'd expect him to be at honestly and now it's about in game action sort of being that more dynamic guy uh being that confident player who I've been here and I know how to make a play on third and six I'm gonna make that catch and I'm gonna you know get be a tough matchup for for people on the for a second level defender so um I think he's having a very good off season though. Um, so yeah, he's in the, in the public's mind, he's definitely stock up. I think there's like starting to be an understanding like, Oh, we don't necessarily always have to talk and I'm not knocking these guys, but we don't always have to talk about Thomas Fedoni and Eric Gilbert first with the tight ends. And I think people are maybe getting to that realization a little bit. I hope so. 
All right. Well, um, Brunts, let's dive over to the defensive side of the ball. So we have Nate Borkercher as holding steady for BC, but stock up for the public, which is a great confusing way to start this whole segment. I love it. Um, we're going to, we're going to go with Michael Brunts on defense, Deshaun Singleton. You can, if you would like to give your answer and then the, uh, the general public's answer, I, I love this too. I'm going to tell you why the general public is wrong now. No, I, I think, <laughs> Deshaun Singleton's an interesting one because I think his whole career at Nebraska, right, he was like a late addition, um, you know, didn't really do all that much last year, but was kind of a fringe guy. And I would say he's a stock up guy right now. I mean, I, I wouldn't say he's come out of nowhere, but I think he's been steadily kind of working himself into a bigger role. I mean, it, you, you look at his size, he's a bigger safety I think that helps him a little bit uh, in this defense, and especially if they need somebody to get downhill and um, kind of help in run support, which I think they will need that. Uh, but no, I think he's, especially with the departure of Miles Farmer, um, you know, he's a guy that is going to have to be counted on this year um, to, to give them big snaps back there because you, you have Marcus Buford. His timeline is still very much up in the air for when he's going to return. And you know, you, you need proven guys back there. And I think Singleton uh, gives them that. I mean, Matt Rule said this week he feels like that's a potential uh, strong point of the defense. I think they feel good about Isaac Gifford. I, you know, they've been working uh, Malcolm Hartsog there a little bit. You have Omar Brown. But I think Deshaun Singleton just brings a little bit different uh, dynamic to that group. I mean, if you stood Malcolm Hartsog and Deshaun Singleton next to each other, you wouldn't even guess that those guys play the same position. So. I, I like his potential there. I think he's a stock up guy that that people should not be at all surprised um, if they see him on the field early on this fall. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to BC for another question on on the defensive backs here. Brian, do you do you have a a, a good feel for who you think the starters are going to be when they they go play Minnesota, or is it hmm. for me because I got asked this question on a different radio show? It it's sort of tough. Like I feel like there's seven eight guys that are in the mix, and it's it would be hard to say this guy for sure is going to start and this guy for sure is going to get the ball at snaps because I think they're still going to be figuring that out early in the season. Yeah, it, it's a little tricky, I think, at at least one of the safety spots. Um, you know, obviously, you've, they've had two sort of, well, I mean, Buford's rehabbing and, and Farmer departs the roster, and that that throws a little confusion into it. But even – even if Farmer were here, I think we'd still be in the same state. I think you can say safely, you know, Newsom's going to be out there. You know, Hartzog's going to be out there. I kind of think Tommy Hill's going to be out there somehow, some way, um, unless they just decide they're really comfortable with some other safeties. And uh, one of those guys is the third cornerback, so to speak. Um, and then Gifford, right? I mean, Isaac Gifford is is going to play. And then I think there's we're talking about sort of for the final spot, Singleton, Omar Brown. Um, I'm trying to think, is there a wild card guy missing? Um, those are the names that come to my mind first. Um, so we'll, we'll see Corey Collier. I don't, we shouldn't dismiss, but it sounds like there's a little work to do still there. Um, so I kind of think Singleton and Omar Brown are really the guys who I'm really curious about right now, if they can bust in and you see them out there the first snap or not. All right, let's stay on the defensive side of the ball. Let's stay with Brian Christopherson, and let's go to Nash Hutmacher. Hutmaker, Hutmaker, is, which which yeah. way is it supposed to be? It's Hutmaker, right? I think so. I think I think it is, actually. I've always I said feel like this is, this is one of those names that switched, I feel like. It was said <laughs> one way for a while, and now it's said another way, and I don't know what to do with it. It has been said the way you introduced him recently, and I remember like kind of thinking like I might need to run stadium stairs. Like it's like, oh man, I've always called him Hutmacher. He's a mon. It's a Monte How about Ball. It's a Monte <laughs> Ball, a Quincy Anunwa, Anunwa. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's different ones in there. Just go there. with Polar Bear. He's stock way up though. Um, I mean, no way up, about it. way up. Yeah. General public feel the same. Yeah, that was that was a really condescending like first answer. I, I loved it. It was great. <laughs> no, I I thought about it after I said it. I was like, these well, idiots think he's way well, up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I you rubes might think. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mean it. Please refer to the listeners as rubes going forward. <laughs> yeah. That'll endear us. I did not mean it that way. I just, you know how it is. Everybody talks about certain guys. It's like, let's get our focus right. Um, public and it, <laughs> general public. But yeah, uh, Nash Hutmacher, Hutmaker is, uh, I mean, I think he's had one of the best off seasons of anybody from what we've heard as both a leader, as both a guy making plays, as a guy who's changed his body. You can tell he's changed his body. Terrence Knighton's very proud of that whenever he speaks of him, about a guy who, yes, he was always thought of as just a, a run plugger, can lift a house sort of guy, but now you're seeing the lateral movement and all that's kind of coming together. And I would put him on that short list of guys who, if he takes his game up a few notches, like you're sort of kind of expecting after what you've heard, it's a game changer for that front. I mean, it really is. If he's like a, and we've seen that before at guys at that position, I always go back to Damian Daniels as a good example. It took him like till his fourth year, I think mm -hmm. where he was really, really good. And he was just starting to destroy stuff and, you know, wreck shop on plays on third and one and all that sort of thing. And if we kind of see that click with, with Nash, um, it'll be, it'll be a monstrous thing for this defense. So, um, definitely stock up and, uh, that people don't have to believe us on that. They can just listen to the coaches and Ty Robinson and everybody. They, they say the same thing about him. Brunts besides just, uh, Nash, is it stock up for the defensive line as a whole from where you thought things might be coming into, uh, the spring and, and now we are where we are in the fall. Yeah, I think there's more guys that are going to play than I expected. I mean, I we've talked a lot this summer about, you know, Brody Tagaloa was a guy that they were expecting to come in and play 15 to 20 snaps this season. And, you know, with the car the car accident for him, I mean, that's a big setback. But, you know, there there's a lot of positivity over there about Ruquan Buckley, who looks, you know, all those defensive linemen look look better. Like, they don't, they don't look as boxy. They look like they can move. Uh, a, a little bit better. Um, you know, I think Blaze Gunnerson is going to be more of a factor at defensive line than edge where, you know, I think some people had, had kind of seen him. Um, and, you know, beyond that, they're going to need a couple guys to step up. But I, I think, you know, they've got six or seven guys that they feel okay about. The question for me, and you saw this last year, they had three guys that they felt great about in that first starting defensive line rotation and there was a noticeable drop off when you mm -hmm. went to that second group like it was stark um and to the point where they didn't really rotate that much at the end of the season um so you've got to figure out a way to get that second group to a point where they can play and, and be serviceable behind behind that first group because i think that really kind of bit nebraska at times last year was they just relied so much on those first three guys and you just can't do that in the big 10 Sticking in the trenches here, but going over to the offensive side of the ball. Brunts, what do we make of uh, Teddy Prohaska? I think we have an idea where, you know, everyone feels like that stock is at right now. Yeah, I mean, it's you don't want to say it's down, but it, if he's not practicing, it's kind of hard to to kind of see the the uptick. I mean, you know, Matt Rule said this week that they're, he's, he's questionable for the first game, likely back for the second game, but... <clears throat> You look at his career. I mean, he he really has not practiced that much. I mean, that's kind of been the unfortunately the story of his career is every time things seem like they're getting ready to take off, uh, you know, you, you get a knee injury or the shoulder or something else or some kind of setback that just you know doesn't um, that that keeps him from doing anything consistently. So I think until that happens, you know, it, it's uh, maybe a little bit incomplete with with you know the stock trending not in a good way. Um, you know, they've got Turner Corcoran at left tackle who uh, has played there a ton. But, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of us were kind of counting on Teddy to step right in and be that starting left tackle. But until he can prove that he can stay healthy, I, I just uh, you can't count on it right now. BC, what kind of blow um, is not having Teddy Prohaska to the confidence that you might have had in the offensive line taking a step forward after last year? Or is it, you know? Or do you even view it in that sense? Um, no, I don't actually, uh, because I it, have been really optimistic about Teddy from what you hear about people like, who know the game way better and what he could be. 
but he hasn't played a lot of college football enough so that I would say you got to be like, okay, this changes our opinion because he's not there. I mean, and it does sound like he's just so people are clear. It sounds like he could be available by week one and hopefully week two was the way rule put it. So it's not like he's out long term, but even if he does come back, then there's going to be, he's really got a long amount of rust to, to knock off. I mean, probably 10 months of rust that you got to get, out of his system it's going to take a while i would think and so um it doesn't change my outlook it was interesting to hear rule on saturday though he was sort of like turner basically turner corcoran's the left tackle i've always known here is what he said you know like so and i thought about that i was like yeah well on our pod and we always talk about stuff because we think about two years ago or a year ago and this mm-hmm. guy's going to be this and that um, and we would always had Teddy at left tackle sort of in this podcast and Turner could slide inside. And um, that maybe hasn't been how the general public has been looking at it or the inside or the guys inside the walls. So um, Turner's Turner's big. I mean, he's got to be like that dude now that's that four star recruit and that he was supposed to be and just own that spot. And honestly, the best case scenario for Nebraska is if they make it really hard for Teddy to to just jump right in, you know, like that. That's what you're hoping Nebraska football is like in mid to late September, where it's like, well, who are you going to move aside even if he is healthy because it's going okay? Yeah, I mean, Turner Corcoran at left tackle becomes a huge X factor for me because we have two years of evidence that has not gone particularly well, uh, especially in Big Ten play. So. Um, that opening game against Minnesota, if that's your left tackle, it's going to be one of those things that certainly be watching uh, early on in that matchup. Let's stay on the offensive side of the ball, and we'll go back to Brian Christofferson. Anthony Grant led Nebraska's team in rushing last year, uh, but Gabe Irvin was the flavor of the spring. Have things changed again, or where do you feel like Anthony Grant finds himself uh, here in fall camp right now? Um, I'd say stocks slightly up uh, for Anthony Grant. Um, I feel like, I don't know if it's changed. I mean, they, they still love Gabe Irvin. And when you see, when you see Gabe over there, you're like, if this dude has the goods and is that battering Ram who can get those extra two yards, I, I mean, it makes sense when you look at him, he just looks, he's this massive dude. Um, but Anthony Grant, I think has really taken to the teaching of, uh, EJ Barthel and just sort of like understanding, like you got to play off your blockers here. You got to understand where your entry point is supposed to be on a run. And, um, you know, you, you also got to know that every play, it's not going to be like the old days where you could outrun them the outside and it's a 55 yard play for huddle. It's sometimes three yards, four yards are the winning plays in the game. And I think they've really reinforced that with him. And it sounds like he's taken to that teaching and, Honestly, his burst is, uh, until proven otherwise, he has the best burst of the bunch that I know of. I mean, Ramir has some of that too, but I think Anthony Grant's one of those home run hitters. So if Anthony does add that piece of his game where he's getting the tough big 10 yards, as you'd say, or whatever, to get second and six, and he has that other piece, that 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 makes him a little something I don't know if the other guys have. And so that's why I, I'm not dismissing him at all right now. Brunts, I don't know if the viewers caught this. I certainly did. You you look like you were gradually increasing the height of your arm coming across the screen there, or were you trying to flatline? Which no. which is it? It's slightly up, I think. I mean, I think yeah, Gabe Irvin is going to have a role, um, but I think here's where I'm curious with Anthony Grant and what I keep going back to last year and the way that the run game was put together and organized it, it just seemed like it was very slapdash, like an afterthought. Yeah. Like you're going to do it for a little bit, just to just a little window dressing so you can then bomb the ball. I think the thing that Anthony Grant will probably benefit from is Yes, he did have trouble getting north and south. I think there was also a little bit of the system working against him a little bit because it just never seemed like there was any kind of dedication to the run game or putting him in good spots. So I'm eager to see what that looks like. You're going to see all three of those backs. I mean, you're, you're going to see Ramir Johnson, Gabe Irvin, and, and Anthony Grant at various points. But it feels like right now, based on what – what we kind of have in terms of past production, it's got to be Anthony Grant. I mean, you know, with, with Irvin, you're still 
it's a little bit like Teddy in some ways. You're projecting quite a bit, but you just don't have that body of work that you can kind of back up that projection with. All right, let's finish up with our last player here for the stock up, stock down segment. We have Brunt's Jamari Butler. What do we know about uh, Jamari and where he fits into things as a, I believe, Jack linebacker in Nebraska's defense? Yeah, I I would say slightly up. I mean, go back to the offseason where Nebraska kind of re-recruited Jamari Butler out of the transfer portal. I mean, he had SEC opportunities. He was his recruitment was kind of quickly uh, get, getting some feet under it, and you know I, I think what Nebraska saw in him was a, a guy that can run, a guy that was probably undersized to be playing defensive end or with his hand in the dirt, which he was at times last season. And you know when when you hear MJ Sherman talk about who kind of the primary pass rushers are and what that jack position looks like, I mean he always mentions Butler first, so. I think MJ Sherman's probably going to be the guy at that spot, but I think there's going to be a place for Jamari Butler in that defense. I think, like I said, I, I think they saw his skill set fitting really well what they want to do in, in, in Tony White's defense. So I'll say slightly up. I think you're going to see a lot more of him. And he was kind of a flashy guy at times. I mean, he, he made a few plays. You can kind of see, you know, what, what the long term might be for him, but, um, you know, the other thing that helps him is he was a guy that really hadn't played a ton of football when he came to Nebraska. So, um, you know, maybe another coach, a different coaching staff, different set of eyes will really help him too. BC, what are your thoughts on on Jamari Butler and and kind of how he could contribute for the 2023 season? Yeah, I think uh, I think Brunt's sort of nailed where he's at right now. With it, it feels like it does feel like MJ Sherman's maybe the lead dog there, but it you know you there's could be a nice Batman Robin combo uh you would hope for and um i i just think uh i th- from what i know about him too he's a he's a pretty good teammate like he's a good like he's a guy who's always been about like uh really caring about like husker football not just himself and husker football sort of getting over the top and so i think uh that's a big deal too f- to have guys like that within your locker room so I'm hopeful it takes off for him because I do remember, as Brunt's mentioned, when he was a recruit, he was one of those guys who's like, you're going to have patience. You got to have patience with him because he's really raw. He's only played like a year of football and all that stuff. And that's an interesting dynamic in this day and age of college sports where, like, can you afford two to three years to grow a guy and still keep him in your program without him wanting to wander or someone else coming in? And so that's where we actually have one of these cases where it's worked out and he stayed put, even though it could have went the other way. So that's kind of exciting. And you kind of hope it it works for that reason, too. Well, I'll say this. I know the staff is betting on being able to keep guys for two to three years with some of the developmental takes that they had in their recent class and some of their commitments in 2024. I mean, you're you're going to have to put in some time on this and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's not going to be quick for for some of those uh, commits or recent signees. Any other players that you would like to, to throw into this segment? Those were the six that I put out there. But uh, if is there a name or two that you would like to discuss, Michael Brunts? Yeah, well, I mean, wide receiver has kind of been the talk of the town. Yeah, I tried very hard to avoid wide receiver because I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Billy Kemp stock way up. Billy Kemp's going to be your number one wide receiver, your punt returner. Ed Foley's in love with the man. Uh, Billy Kemp is as popular of a player over there as I think they have on the offensive side of the ball. After that, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, Alex Foley. Like that's yeah. What you got. yeah, no, I think that's, that's fair. I mean, somebody's got to emerge from that freshman wide receiver group, right? I mean, it is, is, is the freshman wide receiver group trending up? I don't, I don't even know. I mean, I, I think, uh, I can't believe someone that's watched the last five years of Nebraska football said some freshman wide receiver has to emerge, as if that's a thing that we're used to seeing around here. Stanley Morgan, he's the only one. <laughs> you know when that was? It was 2015. I know. The Pac-12 know. still had all 12 teams at that point. I know. Oklahoma I know. and Texas hadn't lit out for the SEC. That was years ago. I know. Nebraska hadn't even lost to BYU with a Hail Mary yet. <laughs> um, Come on. But no. It's a big group. I mean, you got to have somebody emerge, though. I mean, I, if I were if I were betting money right now, I would bet a very, very, very small amount on Jaden Doss being the guy to emerge from that that pile. That's that's my very very weak limp in bet. 
hope everybody has a good time. <laughs> there we go. There it wuss is. Wuss bets. That's my wuss bet. Is Jaden right. Doss emerges? Michael Brunson's wuss bet of the week. Put a little bit of money on Jaden Doss to <laughs> to appear. I guess that's gonna be that. That needs to be a segment in the uh, in, in the hype cast. Yeah, I, I I think it could work. I think it cool. could definitely work. I like how in horse racing there's uh what win place show, but mm-hmm. right now you want to put a little bit of money on someone to appear. Yeah, and uh, and Jaden Doss. So. That would be a win. That that would be the horse coming down the straightaway <laughs> and and pulling ahead and taking third to show and win you like. 80 cents on the $2 bet. There you go. All right. Uh, BC, do you have a player that you would like to, or a position group that you'd like to kind of dive into that we didn't hit on enough here? Um, I think we did hit on him a little bit. I think Blaze Gunnerson is stock up. Um, I think this staff really likes him. It's a matter of if he can be available and have a good year of health, but um, I think he's going to get a lot of opportunities this season. And when you listen closely to the coaches speak of like who's shouting out stuff is the, like the leaders on the defense and knows their stuff. Blaze is in that like four to five guys that get mentioned a lot. And so um, he's a, he's a guy who's very impressive when he's in front of you too. You just like, he's been that way though for a year or two. So now you're just kind of hoping it takes, takes off on the field and all that. But he's a guy I would, I would play some, I, I would, buy a stock in blaze right now okay all right i i just you know this might be stupid i would buy stock in the defensive line like i Mm -hmm. i bought in i've drank the kool-aid on it i like the idea of guys like ty robinson and nash hotmacher and blaze gunnerson recruits that people were really excited about recruits and players last staff was excited about kind of hitting more of their potential of the expectations people had for them uh, you know, with this staff and, and with what Terrence Knighton and Matt Rule and Tony White want to do uh, up front. And they, they aren't the only guys. And there's a whole host of, of young defensive linemen, too, that I'm pretty excited about. I mean, I just uh, compared to where I was last year with the defensive line. And I know the numbers aren't great in terms of production yet, but I, I am very intrigued and, and all in sort of on this defensive line and, and kind of even just moving forward as a program. Like I, I like what they're doing right now. Yeah. I think the defense is going to be pretty good early on. I mean, good enough you, to like keep you them seem in. very concerned about how you were going to phrase that. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I think the defense is going to have to carry the, the day early on. That's what mm-hmm. I think. That's sort of my takeaway. And uh, so that's why I, I don't know if pretty good was the right usage, but like, I feel like they're going to have to be the unit that, you know, maybe you're in that, 20 to 17 game with Minnesota, but it's your defense that has two or three takeaways and sort of sets you up. I don't know. It's just a vibe I get when you listen closely to the comments and it like even when the big big 10 network popped through here and rules talking about, man, they show so many different fronts in this, that they're tough to run it against, you know, and so things like that, it makes you sort of get this impression that the defense is, is winning more than they're losing over there. Yeah. Also, they have an advantage that in a week to week game, it's Nebraska yeah, they three, do. three five is going to be difficult for teams that haven't seen it really much uh, this season. All right, let's take a quick time out. When we come back, we're going to get into some of the news and notes of, of fall camp so far and highlight where things are at, some key injuries. And, uh, you know, maybe we can really dive into a stomach bug that's allegedly going around over there. So all that more here on the Husker 24 seven podcast. News and notes time. So let's uh, let's run through some things that that we've learned so far. Um, Maverick Noonan, freshman uh, that signed from Elkhorn South Legacy, he is out for the season. BC, what's the latest on Maverick Noonan? Yeah, it was a knee injury. Uh, Bruns, make sure I'm right on this. Not not ACL or MCL, right? So it was a yeah, not ACL, but it's going to be a six month recovery. And, um, you know, that's, it's tough when I I don't know what Mavericks injury past is. So if it's like the first big one, that's always tough for, for an athlete, especially when you're ready to roll and you're, you feel like you've got some momentum and he did have a good spring. I didn't get the sense that he was necessarily going to break through a red shirt this year, not because he's not doing well, but maybe because of the depth in front of him. So in that sense, it's one of those things where maybe you can get off the ground pretty fast and be like, all right that this was probably a red shirt type season anyway, 
I'm just going to, you know, build my body back up and, and learn this stuff. And he could be a big factor next year. So it's a, it's a disappointing one, but also one that um, I don't think has to, you know, he, he can come back pretty strong from this and be a factor in 24, which I, I think was kind of the plan all along in a way. All right, Brunch, we talked a little about the wide receiver room, but why is it uh, why is it sort of a mess right now? Well, I mean, part of part of it is, you know, Marcus Washington um, can't stay on the field. Uh, he broke his hand uh, in the summer, came back on Monday, then kind of had like a freak landing, I guess, during a drill. And, and there was some concern that it was maybe, maybe going to be a season ending deal, but uh, Matt Rule said they're expecting him back by the weekend. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's an interesting spot because, you know, you've got Washington, Garcia Castaneda, Billy Kemp. Those are your three guys. You're probably going to pencil in Xavier Betts in there as well, who uh, Matt Rule said was injured, but I think that was more of a short-term illness type thing. Same with Malachi Coleman, uh, based on what he'd said, because Coleman had been practicing on Monday as well. Um, but you, you just need some level of consistency and being out there and going through reps and getting timing down and, and all the stuff that you need as a wide receiver. Um, I, I, I think there's probably a little bit of overreaction to it too, in some ways, because you're in a 30 day fall camp, guys are going to miss time. Things are going to happen. Um, but you know, the, like most positions, I feel like it's not necessarily the top line guys that you're concerned about. It's who's going to be, you know, four, five, six, seven in a rotation. And that's where, you know, you dig into your depth a little bit and you have a, a bullock that comes out of nowhere um, and, and, you know, potentially uh, gets into the wide receiver picture or Ty Han or somebody like that, Jaden Doss, um, if you want to, you know, put your $2 bet down, those kinds of things. Um, you know, have to kind of happen, I think, and especially at that group to, um, you know, give you give yourself a little bit of depth because you're going to you're going to need it through the course of the season. So, yeah, I mean, I that group, you know, Matt Rule is very open about the fact that it's a concern that they don't have a ton of proven depth there. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. I, I don't think that Nebraska is necessarily alone in the Big Ten either about not having a ton of proven wide receiver depth right now. So um, it's going to be a run heavy team. They're going to play a lot of close games, but you, you need some wide receivers that can really stretch the field and, and give your running backs some room to run. BC, as Bruns was talking, all I could think about is a double tight hmm. end fullback formation with one wide receiver. Are we going to see a lot of power from Nebraska football <laughs> with all these tight ends? We talked about them a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, I do think you're going to see a lot of two tight end sets. I think you're, you'll see three tight ends at times. They've said as much. And uh, there's definitely been stations where they've uh, had the fullback. Liebenschritt's been kind of an interesting little fall camp story. We'll see how that sorts out if there's other guys who get into that mix. But he could be a true fullback. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely picture some of that. Um especially off the bat from Nebraska. And I, I think they'll be patient too. Like I think they're going to just the way rule talks that they're going to be a team that slugs it out body below body blow. Maybe there are series where it's just one first down or two first down and you got to punt it, but you're, you're playing the territory game and trying to gain the advantage there. And um, I just think that's going to be sort of the style of football early on for this team, but may, maybe I'll be, proven completely wrong but if you listen to all the interviews that's that's sure the way it sounds like it's going to be a lot of power and uh i don't mind that i i remember still very well uh when jim harbaugh was like one of his first games as michigan's coach they were losing to somebody was watching it and he was run heavy run heavy and th they were going nowhere like he was just sticking with it they were running power and they were going nowhere and I admired it because I was like, you know what? They might lose today, but he's building up a certain mentality with that team of like, this is how Michigan football is going to be again. And I, I keep getting that in my head sometimes when I think about what we might see going forward with Nebraska, sort of just like, this is what we're going to be again over time. And there's going to be tough days that are intertwined with that but you got to stick with that process and just keep hammering away at it with that run game. So I, I totally expect that type of team and we'll see. I think so, people need, 
I, right. I think people need to be comfortable with the fact that if you there's going to be times where you're going to have three wide receivers and one of those wide receivers is going to be Borkature or Fedoni. Like that's just the nature of this offense or Janarian Bonner or somebody like yeah. that. Like it's, I, I, I think there is certainly legitimate concern about the wide receiver position. I also think that over in North Stadium, they they also view the ability, they view their offense as being able to take guys from certain spots too and not be so married to the fact that like a guy in the slot has to be, has to be Billy Kemp or it's got to be, you know, this person. So I think especially early on, you'll probably see a lot of that too. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no doubt that when Marcus Satterfield spoke last week, he basically reiterated what Brunch just said there. They view themselves as positionless in a lot of ways. A guy like Janiron Bonner might be at fullback, might be a tight end, might be at H-back, could go in motion and end up as a wide receiver. Uh, so they're they're willing to to do all sorts of, of kind of different things and, and get different looks out there. What um, What is the status, either of you, of Eric Gilbert, and when do we think we'll know uh, about what's going to happen with him and his attempt to get a waiver from the NCAA as there's been several high-profile denials that have occurred at the beginning of this week? Yeah, it's uh, we need to ask about it again. Um, you know, as of Big Ten media days at the end of July, Matt Rule said they were still sending information back and forth with the NCAA on the appeal. Um, I I think the NCAA is sending a bit of a message with some of the denials. Um, I think people also need to understand that if the NCAA is willing to dig in to each situation, I think that there's very different circumstances for some of these situations that are there. Um, I, I, I noticed yesterday with a couple of them that were um, turned down, you know, guys are moving closer to home, ailing um, family member, grandmother. Yeah. That that's been something even in the past, you know, Luke Ford, at Illinois, um, had a similar situation, um, transferring from Georgia to Illinois, he got turned down. I think that's always been a little bit of a, a dicey thing to kind of hang a, um, appeal on. We'll see with Gilbert. His is a little bit of a different situation. I know Georgia is very much uh, on board with him getting the waiver. I mean, I, I think they're willing to help him however they can. So we'll see how that plays out. But yeah, I, I, w- I would expect you'd probably know something soon if they're starting to roll some of these uh, off the desk, so to speak. But uh, that that's that decision is one that I think looms pretty big for Nebraska's offense. I mean, if they're fine, I think, going ahead without him. But if you add somebody with that kind of talent to your tight end room, that's huge. But I've Maybe I'm wrong, and you guys can correct me, but my sense has always been that Nebraska's always has never seen this as any kind of a slam dunk or like an automatic kind mm-hmm. of thing. Like I think they speak very <clears throat> carefully around it. BC, we had Ed Foley speak uh, earlier this week, and he talked about that kicker competition. And from <clears throat> his mindset or at least what he was willing to share it definitely feels 50 50 are you surprised by that did you expect that Mm -hmm. one of these two guys would just sort of take it early in fall camp and and i mean do you who do you who would you put your two dollar michael brunt's bet of the week on uh to appear Mm -hmm. as nebraska's place kicker against minnesota right now i'd probably still bet on alvano but i think i think people are reconsidering it more um than they probably did going into camp. And I honestly, if you think about it, we probably, you wouldn't expect to hear differently. Would you right now from like Ed Foley? I mean, you don't want to unveil in week two, like, Oh, this guy's made two more kicks than that guy or whatever. Um, I like the way they're doing it. I mean, it, it, the, the thing where you can't, you can't just say for sure is like, this is very data driven. This is not like, this is taking the opinion out of it in a lot of ways. It's just like, these are the kicks that matter. We're going to tell you when they matter. Who makes the most of them? And I think the one thing that was most interesting to me, I don't know if it was for you guys, is I do think there's been sort of this thought, and I had it, um, maybe the general public did as well. Um, um, the GP. <laughs> that I'm just making fun of myself now. But that Alvano had like a, the stronger leg, like the idea that 
you know, he, you picture Alvana like crushing that a 50 yarder in Memorial Stadium. And then you think of like Bleak Road's kick at Michigan, which was terrible weather conditions where it like inched over from 33 yards. And I, you kind of get that in your head and you're like, oh, there's no way that uh, Bleak Road can keep up from a length, you know, when it comes to who has to hit that 48 yarder. But he kind of put that to bed, I thought, fully did a l- little bit that saying they both ha- are about equal there. It, it's been close there. So that kind of jumped out to me the most. Yeah, you know, that was something <clears throat> that surprised me a little bit when he was talking about that. That, And I was the one that asked the question if he was, you know, focused more on accuracy from any one area or if it mattered if a guy could hit from 52 and at a higher clip, is that more important to you than if, if both of them are hitting about the same at 45 or whatever else? And he, he said that at previous stops, they've done it where they had someone that was maybe uh, – a lot more accurate, shorter, but didn't have the legs. So they'd have a guy for their long range kicks and a guy for their shorter kicks. And he kind of quickly said that he didn't anticipate that was going to happen at Nebraska. So I, I think they're going to have one guy there uh, real quickly too. it. You have those two guys for kickoffs as well. And then also Brian Buscini. And so those three are, are involved in your, your kickoff situation. I suspect uh, it wouldn't be a thing where Bleak Road wins the kicking job that they would have Alvano do kickoffs as well. Um, you know, I, I think that you're probably just going to have either, um, you know, the winner of the kicking competition or Sheeny also do your kickoffs. Like, I don't I don't know that you're going to see a scenario where all three are are being used just kind of based on how uh, fully talked about it. I, I thought of one more stock up, stock down. Uh, holding steady, and this one's probably a little bit unfair because we don't have that much data on it, and you're judging entirely on what these players look like. But uh, at least to me, Corey Campbell right now seems like stock up with how some of these guys have sort of transformed their uh, their bodies from what we saw at the end of last season, what we saw, uh, you know, under Zach Duvall and what that staff was attempting to do with some of these players to now what, you know, the Nash Hutmockers and Bryce Benharts and guys like that look like what what have you sort of noticed from a strength and conditioning standpoint when you're just kind of assessing how different some of these guys look yeah they don't i, I mentioned this with with hot maker he, i mean he the the defensive line looks different physically like they they don't look as they don't look like they've just been squatting all winter um we'll see if they if it actually like me, I you don't know, you never know until the first game, right? Like, and well, I don't, get a- I don't like to talk about strength and conditioning because it's a lot of it is just you, you can see something, but you have no idea if it's you know, right functional strength, mm-hmm. if it's usable, if it's right. going to result in anything. So, when Minnesota is trying to crank the running game at you, we're going to find out really quick whether or not the offseason workout workouts and the change in things, if, if that worked. Um, same with the offensive line. I mean, if, if you get up there and you can't run the ball against Minnesota, I mean, you know, or you do, I mean, that, that gives you a sense of kind of where things are. So I, I'm the same way where it's like, okay, a guy, you know, put on 10 pounds, a guy looks like significantly different. Okay, great. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really get too deep into the weeds about what they're doing, how they do it, that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it, it really just kind of matters whether or not it, it happens on Saturday. So we'll see. All right. Any any final thoughts? Anything you guys want to get off your chest? Anything uh, that you would like to say before we close out today's podcast? BC, any other comments you'd like to make on behalf of the general public? <laughs> I want to apologize to the general public because that sounded like a, a jer- like, like a jerk store comment <clears throat> from me early in the podcast. <laughs> I, I I think a lot of people, though, would go back and they'd say, I'm actually, it would be one of those things where someone says something and you're like, yeah, I'm with that. I'm over here. I'm not with the general public that is always talking about only Thomas Fedoni and Eric Gilbert. I talk about Nate Porkercher, too. So hopefully, hopefully everybody just sees themselves as that. Okay. Brunts, anything you, you'd like to say to finish things out here? Uh, I'm trying to decide which side I'm on, if I'm the general public or if I'm on BC's. <laughs> up in BC's Ivory Tower, um, <laughs> it's got sweet views though. It does. You know, it's got good 360 views. all the way around. Nice. You can see a lot. In, from you, up in your world, I'm up there like looking down at Jack Stoll, like making yeah. fun of like. Yeah. What is with BC and tight end? Man, <laughs> BC. 
tight end. Uh, no, I don't have anything. I think we covered a lot of ground. There will be more ground to cover uh, because we have access Friday, Saturday, and then four times next week as well. So there will be lots to talk about as talking, right. talking season rolls on. Well, we cover talking season really well at Husker 24-7, whether it's uh, Brunson myself or whether it's BC churning out 700 stories a day for the general public to read and then formulate their opinions on. We have all the coverage that you need at Husker 24-7. And, of course, there's plenty of recruiting uh, happening as well. And so we can dive into some of that with the next podcast, too. Uh, maybe go over where Nebraska's at with some of their top targets remaining in the 2024 class. All that good stuff. And you can find everything at Husker247.com. For Michael Brunts and Brian Christopherson, I'm Mike Shaver. We're Husker 24-7. We'll catch you next time.